Give thanks for this precious day, for all gathered here in those far away, for the time we share with love and care. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. You know, as you can see, Beth Damon has crafted our cornucopia for the sanctuary this morning. And it is absolutely beautiful. We had a, a talk about what could be on it, oh, in it. And I mentioned something that I'm going to be mentioning later in my sermon, but we have fruit, apples, grapes. We have nuts, walnuts, pecans. We have yams, sweet potatoes, something that is dear to me, as well as corn, and bread. Hmm. Fresh bread. Breaking bread together this morning with our cornucopia. We would like to invite you to help us to create a virtual cornucopia of Thanksgiving. Now this is optional, but in one or two words, what are you most thankful for?
And thanks all of you for um, participating either in the chat or the mentee. Uh, just so you know, the more we get of a particular uh, word, the bigger it is. And I noticed that family was the biggest. Um, so it, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Our opening hymn is number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. It's in the gray hymnal. And I invite you to sing with us, or if you'd like to just listen and let the music and the video wash over you. I'm really particularly proud of the choir this week. Um, we mixed, I think, 13 different audio uh, tracks and pictures of their doors and some a lot of things together. So I hope you enjoy this special gift from the choir. Uh, again, sing if you'd like, or just let the music be what it needs to be for you today. Number one, may nothing evil cross this door. Behind each of these doors lives a member of your choir. In this season of gathering, even though we can't all be together, we just wanted you to know how much we're thinking of you, that we miss you, that we love you. And we're so looking forward to the time when we can all be together outside these doors. Know that our hearts are with you. May nothing evil cross this door, and may your fortune never cry Let us now light the chalice, a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We invite you to light a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Please join us now in saying these words of affirmation adapted from Universalist Minister L. Griswold Williams. Along with the doctrine of, our, of this church, the quest for truth is a sacrament and service is a prayer. To draw together in peace 
to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need. To the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Let's do we cover them. Thank you so much to the Denison family. That is just about the sweetest chalice lighting ever. And now it is the time for all ages. And we have Brian Blanchett, not only as our guest musician today, but Brian also agreed to let me ask him a few questions for the time for all ages today. And it was such a great chance to talk and learn from Brian. We decided to pre-record it so that we might have um, some thoughts to share in extra bonus videos after worship. But I've selected the parts where we focused on gathering and food, which is the theme of today's worship. So. Hi, my name is Brian Blanchett. I'm a Melvegan Abenaki, uh, and I'm a singer, songwriter, and promoter of the Abenaki language. Well, thank you so much for being here. You're a member of the Nolhegan band of the Kusuk Abenaki? Yes, yes, yeah. And and how what what kind of interactions do you have as a as a band, as a community? I, I, as a band, there's something that there's, there's always a meeting uh, once a month. A lot of businesses talk. Don Stevens, who's doing a great job uh, bringing things to the Abenaki people, will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but afterwards, it's the, it, it, there's, a, there's a feast, the potluck, it's just a gathering, you know, and people are getting together and, and, and singing. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's always great. There are, uh, we, in, in uh, usually early March, late February, we have the snow snake games. There's a, there's a summer, usually a summer gathering of, of, of some kind where, where people get together and we get to, we get to camp out, you know what I mean? So, so you're, you're, if you're camping out, there's a whole nother interaction than if you're all going to a hotel and then coming back and seeing each other in, in the morning. Yeah. And I really look forward uh, to those, to those meetings. You know, somebody will bring up crock pot with venison stew or there's buffalo chili or there's, there's something along. There's nothing like filling up that plate with as much different things as you possibly can. And then sitting down and, and socializing, you know, you know, bring the children, uh, yeah, I love eating. I love the food, and I I love the food at the gatherings. Yeah, that's great. Well, and what better way to socialize than to, than to eat together? Really, right? There's nothing better than that, right? Exactly. No. And so, how is a gathering different than a powwow? A powwow, there's uh, vendors set up. You know, uh, you, usually about twenty something vendors at a, at a relatively decent powwow. And there's a dance circle set up. There's a drum arbor where there's usually at least one drum, hopefully two or three. And you've got an MC that's that's and then an arena director that's actually kind of coordinating everything with the dancers, the drums, and the MC. Um, so it's far more formal, but it's more open. It's usually open to the public. I've never seen a gathering where native people have said, "Hey, that guy's too white. Get him out of here." But it's not something that's advertised to the public to come to it's it's you know on a people will know about it. at a gathering the emphasis really is on socializing hmm. so i i know it's a complicated question but i wonder if you might just be let me, let me, sharing what are what are your thoughts about the current holiday of thanksgiving in this country and how do you how do you honor or not honor it I, I have always uh, celebrated Thanksgiving. Do you know of any colonial history of giving thanks and having a feast like that? First, and the first European, first I know of Europeans celebrating and giving thanks for what they have was at that first Thanksgiving. I don't know of it any other time in history, but I have been told 
and read that this has always been giving thanks is something that native people have always done. Be thankful for what you have, right? Mashpee Wampanoags are livid about Thanksgiving. They don't celebrate it and they protest. Some, and somebody had recently brought that topic up and I said, we need, Thanksgiving is our, is, is our holiday. That's an Algonquin holiday. And we showed them how to be thankful it's time to decolonize Thanksgiving. You know, the pilgrims had turkey, but Massasoit, along with the party that traveled with him, brought five deer. Yeah. Do you have ideas for how you might keep that core part of it that you have touched on of the giving thanks is, is a, a fundamental part of indigenous culture and to really reclaim that part of it? Do you know how you might in this time of pandemic, focus on the gratitude? I, I, I haven't really given that much thought, but I think, you know, um, among indigenous people, your wealth is what you can give. Hmm. It's not the, the, what you've attained, it's what you can give. So perhaps donating to something, you know, and even if it's just energy would, would be a, a better way of looking at it. I haven't gotten that far in my, uh, in, 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 in my thought process, really. Yeah. Thanks so much for being in worship with us today. Do you have any final message um, at this time of entering Thanksgiving? Keep your loved ones close, stay, stay, stay in touch. Right, reach out to somebody. You know, I'm not saying this for me, but you know, I'm sure there are people out there that really need that phone call right now. I mean, the poor grandparents that, that can't see their, their grandchildren, really, right? I mean, it's yeah. let's let's have a Zoom. We're figuring out ways to have Zoom concerts. So if we can do that, we, we should be doing more with our uh, with our families, you know, and and reaching out or just neighbors, you know. It's that time now. It's that, it's that time in society and that time of year. So yeah. That. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much, Brian. I learned a lot from our conversation and I will post later a link to the elements of our discussion where you talk about what it means to you to sing in the Abnaki language, but what better way to experience that then to have you share another song with us so thank you so much for doing this musical interlude for us now this is a this is an old song and in, in, uh, an old wabanaki song that uh the Megama, uh this is their greeting song that that's what it's known as right now um I mean, it, it's their peace song, sorry. Uh, but it's written in an old language. It's written in our ceremonial language. And uh, I asked uh, an elder one time about the ceremonial language. He told me that when you can feel true pain for someone that's done you harm, then you're ready for the ceremonial language. You know, my, my, my mantra is that I'd, I'd like, I, I'm, I'm hoping to be ready for the ceremonial language sometime soon, but, and, and, and that's certainly a goal. But without further ado, this is a, this is a peace song. He go, he gone dead, quail he, quail he, quandale a quando de. Cuando de, cuando 
Now, please join me in a word of prayer by Marta Valentine called In Gatherings. And we can create this atmosphere by closing your eyes or keeping them open, putting your hand to your heart or any other way that you can join us in a word of prayer. In gatherings, we are stirred like the leaves of the fall season, rustling around sacred trees, tossed hither and yon until we come to rest together, quietly, softly. We come to gather strength from each other. We come to give strength to each other. We come to ask for strength from the spirit of all that is and is not. When our hearts sing and when they frown, it is the way of compassion telling us to give. It is the way of peace telling us to share our gifts. For we are happiest and most powerful when love is made apparent in and through us. Spirit of the circle that is love, we, as we twirl in this dance that is life, we give thanks for reminding us each day of our task of ministering to each other with a searching glance, a safe, responsible touch, a generous smile, a thoughtful word. Thank you for reminding us that we are always building a beloved comunidad. Thank you for reminding us that through our covenant with you, we covenant with each other in our made whole. In gratitude, we celebrate with open hearts and minds. We discover who we are separate from each other and within one another. In this circle that holds all life, may we work toward widening its boundaries until there are none. Amen and blessed be. In his book published last year, David Silverman argued that the telling and retelling of the myth 
of the first Thanksgiving pulls on a history passed down through the generations of what happened in Plymouth. That local Native Americans welcomed the courageous and pioneering pilgrims to a celebratory feast. In his book, This Land is Their Land, he argued that these falsehoods are deeply harmful to the Wapanag, those whose lives and society were forever damaged by the English arrived when after the English arrived in what colonizers called Plymouth. Silverman says that, and I quote, focusing on the pilgrim's noble religious and democratic principles instead of on the harmful, shameful Indian wars and systems of slavery more typical in the colonies enable whites to think of the so-called black and Indian problems as Southern and Western exceptions to an otherwise inspiring national heritage. Silverman goes on to argue that though Americans eventually assumed that the Thanksgiving holiday and myth are marched together in an unbroken secession since 1621, those traditions were very much products of white Protestants, particularly Northerners, asserting their cultural authority over European immigrants and Americans of color in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Wampanoags today remember the Puritan separatist entry to in their homeland as a day of deep mourning, rather than a moment of giving thanks, as, as we has rit have ritualized it in a national holiday, as though we started it. In fact, indigenous groups have always gathered in thanks, and not just one time or one season in a year, as Brian, our guest musician, stated. They had long recognized the healing and restorative power of gratitude and gathering, especially giving thanks to the earth and creator for sustaining life and the reciprocal relationship of receiving from the earth and giving thanks for a sustaining bounty. Our religious ancestors, especially those UU churches that can trace their lineage to the 1600s were on the receiving end and took land, took lives and dominated with white supremacy. This tradition that was here before the pilgrims landed fact and it was adapted after Africans were forcibly enslaved here. The healing power of gathering took place in the slave quarters. It was continued by Southern emancipated black families in freedom and transported North as Southern families migrated fleeing Jim Crow discrimination and racial violence to find that the grass wasn't greener on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line. The movie Soul Food exemplifies this. I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen the movie Soul Food, but it was a film in 1997. I was a sophomore in college. I'm dating myself a little bit, but... <laughs> And it featured an ensemble of black actors and actresses like Vanessa Williams, Vivica A. Fox, Nia Long, and Mackay Pfeiffer. And it was written directed by George Tillman Jr. based on his own family and the contemporary black experience. The film centers on the trials of a family held together by the longstanding family tradition of preparing Sunday dinner and gathering together in thanks and in love. The film was widely acclaimed for presenting a more positive image of African-Americans than is typically seen in Hollywood. Big Mama was the rock of the family, the one who held and kept the family together. 
her Southern traditions moved up when her family migrated to Detroit. As Southern cooking and Northern kitchens kept families together and tight and not just on Thanksgiving as witnessed in the film. And for most and many families, Southern dinners were like Thanksgiving where extended families would get together, break bread together, eating soul food. Big Mama said, soul food cooking is about cooking from the heart. The family is much stronger together, she would say. Harvesting the food from the earth, preparing the earth with care and love, of preparing the food with care and love, fellowshipping together, tasting food cooked from the heart, healing food, soul food. But Big Mama fell into a coma for over a month and eventually passed away. And the family fell apart for a time as they ceased gathering. Big Mama's grandson, Ahmad, the narrator of the film, plotted and tricked the family to resume the tradition. And it worked. It didn't make their relationships perfect or fix every issue, but they were not perfect or fixed before. But at least they were able to fellowship and heal together again, tasting and eating food gathered from the earth, cooked from the heart, food for the soul. One of the big, biggest takeaways for me is the one thing that Ahmad realized, and I quote, so now I know what folks, what soul food was all about. You see, during slavery, us black folk didn't have much to celebrate. So cooking became how we expressed our love for each other. And that what mo those Sunday dinners meant to us. It meant more than just eating. It was a time to share our joys and sorrows, something the old folks say is missing in today's families. Again, the healing power of gathering, the reciprocity of giving thanks for what is received in fellowship, connection like indigenous peoples connected with each other and the earth. You know, my family had a soul food experience. No, we did not have big Sunday dinners um, every Sunday, but we did have a special dinner on Thanksgiving, like most of you. My mother's staple dish with her Southern roots, the dish that she put the most love into. And my siblings will differ on me because some people say that her dressing <laughs> was her staple dish, but for me, it was her corn, cornbread casserole. A dish that this non-cook, and I can't cook, <laughs> who wanted to know how to make because it was so good. You see, it was really the love that warmed my heart. And she taught me how to make it before she died three years ago. When she passed away peacefully due to Alzheimer's and dementia, we stopped gathering for a time. It was hard. I spent many a Thanksgiving by myself, content that I was by myself. I needed to be by myself. But like Big Mama's family did in Soul Food, because my mother was the glue that kept our family together. We recently restored our family tradition after over two years of grieving, but now the pandemic has halted our progress and our healing. I know I'm not alone in this. I know I'm not alone in this loss. The sacrifices that we are making for the greater good and health of ourselves and others, especially our loved ones, are so appreciated 
and necessary. With an 87-year-old father, who I haven't seen in over a year, and COVID on the rise, we are not gathering together this year. But how do we make sure that we don't miss out on our lives? The lives of our family and friends, our chosen families, our traditions, our gatherings, the warmth, the love, the healing that comes with all of that. How do we show our gratitude for the earth that is sustaining our lives even through this pandemic? How do we make sure that seclusion, isolation, and loneliness does not take over our spirits, especially after being out of our normal lives for such a long time? It is vital and so important as Brian said, that we make the effort this year to find adaptive ways of gathering responsibly and food can help warm our hearts and heal our souls this year. So what am I doing? I know I'm in Vermont, far away from home. <laughs> well, I've been in a bubble with a Northern Vermont family and we are having a masked when not eating, socially distant brief Thanksgiving dinner, eating across multiple rooms with verified COVID results as entry. They are my adapted family and especially with a 92 year old grandmother in the home. And I am most thankful for that. It's not the same, but it's something in its one way. However, my biological family who are in DC, New Jersey, Georgia, Massachusetts, New, New York are not gathering, but we are going to gather together over Zoom in the evening to stay connected. It's not the same, but it's so important right now to stay connected while sacrificing and even get my father to make an appearance. And he's the type of elder that powers off his cell phone when he's not using it. Ugh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> aggravates me. But that's the second way. But one thing that I am requesting, and if they're online right now or watching this later, of my siblings, is that we make a dish of mama's corn cornbread casserole to mix the ingredients with compassion, to heat the casserole in the oven with care, to let it rest with reflection and to eat it at the same time together, though separate with love, remembrance, and healing and not on Zoom, but in our hearts and minds. How are you gathering without gathering? What adaptive and creative and responsible ways are you not missing out on the healing power of gathering and not neglecting to give thanks to the earth, to the spirit of life, to the creator? What food warms your heart and heals your soul? The food that you can savor, remember, and be comforted by. What's your soul food? Let us be reminded of the healing power of gratitude and be reminded often and not just once a year. Let the healing power of responsible and creative gatherings give you comfort and keep you in health and peace. Let the healing power of soul food restore you and relieve grief, pain, loss, and loneliness. Let our sacrifices not be in vain. Let them not be in vain. You know, I cannot wait to taste my mother's corn casserole again, to smell its wholeness, 
to feel its warmth, to savor its flavors, and to feel loved. To give love and thanks to the earth and to life. To know that we have a community here, that we have a family here, a chosen family. And that is something that we all can be grateful and thankful for. And that is truly food for the soul. May it be so and blessed be. Our closing hymn is number 67. We sing now together. It's based on a traditional Thanksgiving melody that I think will be familiar for many of you. And I will be sh attempting to share this. So please join in and sing or let the music flow over you. We sing now together our songs of thanksgiving, rejoicing in words for the ages of God. For life that enfolds us and helps and heals and holds us, and leads beyond the poles which our forebears once sought. We sing of the service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry with it within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of community, the spark of hope, and the days and weeks ahead. As we do so, let us join in saying the mission statement of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth, our home. We are one, never has it been ever more true than now. We have extinguished this flame, but the sparks within us remain alight. For each of us in our own of supposed solitude, the signals buzz and hum and sparkling through space one to another, connecting us visibly, but palpably. We are one and from every window, our light shines. So go in peace, blessed be, happy Thanksgiving everyone. Thank you, Brian, for being our guest musician and peace everyone.